morning. Please rise if you're able for the call to worship. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. And now as we praise this God, let's sing from um, the red hymnal number 162 printed in your bulletins of the Father's love begotten. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity that you call us to worship you. Father, I ask that this morning you would guard our hearts, that you would focus our attention on you. We confess that it can be so difficult to focus on you during this holiday season, even though it really is about you. And Father, even the more so as we are often now at home quarantined. Father, we ask that despite these impediments, despite these distractions, that you would focus us on you during this next hour, that we would give you the worship and the glory that you call us to give. And that, Father, even though our worship is imperfect, that you would use this to glorify your name. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. ancient and traditional part of Christian worship to read the law of God. It's a calculated risk to do so. They say it's a calculated risk because for time out of mind, people have gotten the idea that this is a list of rules, that if I follow and do this formula, that my life will be okay and I will be all right with God. Um, but that is a complete misunderstanding of what the law is. You know, Jesus told us that the law is summed up uh, in the commands to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so to do a list of rules without love is to completely miss the point and actually to break the law. 
And somebody might say, well, then fine, I'll try to do these things with love or out of love, but I don't need God for these things. But, you know, the truth of the matter is that the Bible tells us that God is love, that, that we've got no idea what love is apart from God. God is the definition of love. And what we find as we turn to the New Testament is that there's no way that we can really know God and be right with God apart from Jesus Christ. And so if this law is truly understood, we can't miss that it brings us to Christ. That's the purpose of it. I hope you'll hear it that way today. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You'll not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, or daughter, nor your servants, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that those who serve you may rest as you do. Remember that you were once enslaved, that the Lord your God redeemed you with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or set your desire in your neighbor's house or land, his servants, his animals, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. See, it's not that the law is one way of getting to God and Christ is another way, or that the law is an older way to get to God that has failed. The law if we really understand it, brings us to Christ, and Christ brings us to God. Would you join with me in praying together this prayer of confession aloud, and then I'll give you some opportunity to uh, engage in silent prayer, confessing your own sins, and seeking God's grace through Christ. Let's pray together. Father, help me to test and examine myself to see if I am abiding in Christ, knowing that Christ is surely in me, unless I fail the test. And take a moment to confess your own sins to the Lord to seek his grace. Speaking on the authority of his master, the Apostle John tells us, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thanks to God for his great love to us.
For our responsive reading this morning, we'll be reading from Psalm 147, printed in your bulletins. Psalm 147. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of a man. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Extol the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. For he strengthens the bars of your gates and blesses your people within you. He grants peace to your borders and satisfies you with the finest of wheat. He sends his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He spreads the snow like wool and scatters the frost like ashes. He hurls down his hail like pebbles. Who can withstand his icy blast? He sends his word and melts them. He stirs up his breezes and the waters flow. He has revealed his word to Jacob, his laws and decrees to Israel. He has has done done this this for no other nation. nation. They do not not know know his his laws. laws. Praise Praise the Lord. Lord. Amen. Well, this is the last uh, Sunday of 2020. Um, I think for many of us, we'll be glad to see this year go and hope that the new year will bring uh, better things. Um, Let me ask you that if you've uh, not made your end of the year uh, tithes or giving yet, we'd appreciate very much if you were to do that. But at this time in our worship, it's important that we offer ourselves to God. And so uh, we're going to take that time in our service now to do that. Uh, thinking about the word of God when it tells us, so do not worry, saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For the pagans run after all these things, but your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well.
But Father, the Lord Jesus, before he ascended, told us that he would not leave us as orphans, but that he would come to us. And because the Spirit of God lives in us, that spirit by which we cry out, Abba, Father, we can be sure that we are not orphaned, not uncared for in the world. And so, Father, help us, even in difficult times, to live our lives in boldness and courage and the full assurance of our Father's love for us, which comes to us through Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. So as is our custom, we will be confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. And it can um, be a little strange doing this via live stream. Often when we do it, we think of confessing our faith before other believers um, and professing what it is that we believe. <laughs> But it's not just before other believers whom we confess this faith. It's before our Lord Jesus Christ. So even for those of you who are um, participating by live stream this morning, worshiping by live stream this morning, let us confess what it is that we as Christians believe. I believe in God the Father Father Almighty, maker maker of heaven heaven and earth. earth. I believe believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, Son, our Lord, who who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us now go before our God in prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning, this Sunday after Christmas, with a fresh appreciation of Jesus coming into this world as a baby, a baby destined to live and to die for our sins. For Father, we read in Luke's gospel account of the response of your servant Simeon, this old man whom you moved to go into the temple courts when Joseph and Mary brought Jesus there for the purification rites. And Simeon, this righteous and devout man who gathers Jesus up in his arms, praises you for your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Yet in Simeon's prophecy, we hear so poignantly, not just the joyful expectation, but also the pain that was bound up in that life. For this child, he said, is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword, he told Mary, will pierce your own soul too. Fathers, we reflect back on that historical event of Jesus coming into this world as a man We confess that we see it each year with awe and amazement and wonder, for though we grasp the physical reality of Jesus' birth, we struggle to comprehend what it means for the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God to choose to be bound by the frailties of human flesh and time and space so that he might accomplish that promise of his to us, to those whom he chose before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. Father, when we see Christmas as this pivotal event, we see ourselves as insignificant as we truly are, as created beings whose worth comes only from your salvation and designation. For our lives, our fleshly lives, are of no worth, of no merit in ourselves. With the Apostle Paul, we too each proclaim, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This morning we ask that this truth, this reality of our lives being crucified with Christ, would be realized even more in each of us this coming year. As we have received Christ Jesus the Lord, give us the strength to so walk in him, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Father, we ask with boldness that you would extend your salvation even more this coming year throughout the world. For you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. No matter what bulwarks the nations may construct, you remain all-powerful and sovereign. No civil enterprise nor the rebellion of a single human heart can thwart your plan. In Quebec, we pray for the ministry of Ben and Melanie Westerveld. Thank you for this recent opportunity that Ben had to discuss the incarnation of Christ during a Muslim-American, Muslim-Christian dialogue group. Father, we ask that his words would have fruit, that those listening would come to know Jesus, not as another prophet, but as the prophet, the Son of God and the Savior of the world. In Missouri, we pray for Paul and Sarah Morale in West Plains, that you would continue to bless their church as you add new members to their congregation. And we rejoice that this church is an answer to prayer, to a prayer that one of your servants prayed for 30 years, that a church might be planted in that community. Father, let this prayer also be an example to all of us, that we may similarly approach your throne with patience and persistence and perseverance, as you have taught us. Here at Bethel, we pray that you would be pleased to work through us to extend your kingdom, that we would be faithful and willing witnesses to your salvation, that we would prioritize your love over our own comfort and social standing. And in addition to our individual witness, we ask that you would bless the work of this congregation, especially during these difficult times, that you would use our website and live stream that Jean and Brian so faithfully maintain to enable more to worship you. We pray as well as you have taught us for our daily needs. Father, we grieve with those who have been affected by the coronavirus. We know of some of the pastor in Northern California who is in the hospital, of Michael's friend who has returned home but was still on oxygen, of Laura and John's extended family members who are recovering, and of their neighbor who has an acquaintance who is pregnant and dealing with COVID-19. And Father, we know that these are only a few of the many who are struggling with this disease. Father, we ask for your mercy on our country and our world, that you would, in your good providence, withdraw this scourge from us, and that as you do so, that we would glorify you as God, for through, though we see human weakness in the face of this virus, yet we know that even it is of no match to you. We pray for our other physical maladies as well. For Mark, our brother at the Sterling Church, we pray for successful chemotherapy treatments. And we thank you for such a speedy and dramatic answer to prayers on Christmas morning. Through his physical trial, continue to gird him up, to give him the hope and faith that he has so boldly proclaimed since being diagnosed with cancer. And grant to Beth as well peace and hope and faith. For Michael's dad, we pray that his eyesight would be restored, that he would have the physical means required to care for the others in his household. For Lally, we pray that she would heal fully and quickly from her hip surgery, and the same for Emily following her thyroid procedure. We thank you for the wonderful news about Justin and Anna's baby, how you have so completely answered our prayers already. Continue to be with this child, giving him not only physical health, but spiritual quickening as well. We continue to pray for our communities, Father, for those who live in the vicinity of the church building, that you would use the development efforts here to extend your kingdom. And for those who exercise civil authority, for the president, for the Congress, the judiciary, as well as local leaders like Kelly Burke, the mayor of Leesburg, that 
they would have wisdom and integrity as they carry out their responsibilities. Father, your servant David wrote in the Psalms that one thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. This morning we ask the same, that we may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our lives, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in your temple. And as we pray, we do so with hopeful expectation, for we have that merciful promise of Jesus's, that all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And so, Father, this morning as we come before you, We do so in the name of Jesus, our Savior, praying as he has taught us. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we prepare to hear God's word, uh, please rise if you're able and let's sing All My Heart This Night Rejoices. beautiful hymns today. Thank you for that. Ah, when to take down the Christmas decorations, right? That's the question. And uh, people have different answers for that. I've spoken with some people who took them down yesterday. Christmas was this past week. This was the weekend after, and it's done. Uh, There are some people who will wait until January 1st or that weekend. That's when they take it down. Some people take it down on January 6th, that Epiphany. And um, Epiphany is the celebration in uh, liturgical churches, the marking of when the Magi came and the knowledge of Christ went to the Gentiles. And I've, I've spoken with some people who said, you know, I don't really have any plans to take down my Christmas decorations. 
Uh, winter is cold and hard and dark, and this past year has been a hard year, and I'm just going to leave them up. It makes me happy, brings joy to me, and brings joy to my neighbor, and sometime maybe when it gets a little bit warmer, I'll think about taking them down. And it's amazing, you know, what the spirit of Christmas can do for us. Uh, during World War I, there was something that happened. You can look it up. It's referred to as the Christmas miracle. It's something truly amazing that happened on Christmas Eve in the year 1914 as there were uh, German soldiers in the trenches uh, to the east and French and British soldiers to the, in the trenches uh, to the west. Some of these uh, trenches only 100 yards or so apart. And there was a lull in the, in the machine gun fire and the lobbing of the mortars. And all of a sudden, in the Western churches, they could hear the German troops singing Christmas hymns in German, but they were familiar to them. They were hymns that were known the world over. And uh, some of those French troops began joining in and singing those same carols in French. And the English soldiers joined in and sang those Christmas hymns in English. And the whole thing became contagious along the trench lines until there was this harmony of voices in three languages. Some uh, estimate that it was about 100,000 voices singing Christmas hymns together but that wasn't even the most amazing thing. What happened next is that some of those soldiers began to go over the top, as they said, up over the trenches, toward no man's land, not in an assault, not with weapons, but with empty hands, singing as they went, and men from both sides came out and they met in the middle, in the beaten zone, in uh, no man's land, and they exchanged gifts that they had from home, newspapers or a brandy or tobacco or chocolate that they had from home, and they clasped arms and they continued singing. And it's really no wonder that it's called a, a, a Christmas miracle. The, the generals, safely away from the line, called that fraternizing, and they didn't like it very much. didn't last. The next day, they were back to killing each other. You know, the spirit of Christmas can be amazing, but the spirit of Christ is abiding. It lasts. And I want to read to you today from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through five, this is the Lord Jesus speaking, and he says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. Father, help us. We pray not only today, but throughout this year and Father, throughout our lives, to abide in Christ. Send the Spirit of Christ to abide in us that we may abide in Him. Amen. Well, we can know that the Spirit of Christ is abiding in us if we are abiding in Christ, if we're remaining in in Christ. But how can we tell if we're remaining in Christ? Well, Jesus goes on in the rest of this chapter to answer that question for us. 
And he tells us that to abide in him means for us to love one another. And this is what he says in verses 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now abide in my love. If you obey my commands, you will abide in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands, and abide in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. And Jesus speaks here about obeying his commands and about bearing fruit. And, you know, we often hear those words and we take them as kind of standalones and we supply what we think that Jesus means by obeying his commands or what the fruit is that he's speaking about bearing. And the things that we come up with oftentimes are plausible. They may not even be wrong, so to speak, but they're not really what Jesus is talking about here. See, Jesus is very clear that the fruit that he's talking about, that the command that he's talking about is to love one another. And you know, loving someone does not mean having necessarily warm fuzzies about that person. Doesn't mean necessarily having a fond affection for someone. Now, certainly we ought to try to foster fond affection it's easier to love someone that we have fond affection for. But love, as the Bible defines it, consists in seeking the well-being and the good of another. And so we're told to love our neighbors as ourselves. Think about that for a moment. How do you love yourself? Does that mean you always like yourself? I don't always like myself don't always feel good about myself. But it does mean that you seek your good. If you're really seeking your good, it means sometimes that you'll seek your repentance. C.S. Lewis once observed, the difference between a Christian and a worldly man is that the worldly man treats certain people kindly because he likes them. The Christian, on the other hand, trying to treat everyone kindly, finds himself liking more and more people as he goes on, including people he could not imagine liking at the beginning. Anybody who's ever sought seriously to abide in Christ knows what he's speaking of. That there are people, as I as I think back over my life before I was a Christian, I would have defined loving uh, people as those people that I like, right? And as I became a Christian and learned more and more, still imperfectly, but I, I, I pray more and more as time goes by to love people that I find myself liking more and more people. But what Jesus speaks here is not about all people, not at this point anyway. Jesus said in chapter 13, a new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus is talking here about the love that brothers and sisters in Christ have for each other as a witness, as a testimony to him. 
of all loves, love for one another in the body of Christ, is the hallmark of those who are abiding in Christ and in whom the Spirit of Christ abides. Now, that doesn't mean that Christians should show an unjust partiality for other Christians. The Bible, in fact, forbids us from doing that. We're told that God is impartial toward us, that he doesn't show partiality. But it does mean that our love, our loyalties for one another in the body of Christ are held by us to be higher than any other loyalty, be those ethnic loyalties or national loyalties or political and partisan loyalties. Secondly, Jesus tells us that to abide in him means bearing the hatred of the world. It's quite a study in contrast. He speaks about love on one hand and hatred on the other. And this is what he says. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. They observe my teachings, they will observe yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who has sent me. If you are abiding in Christ, the world will hate you. Now, let me explain that when Jesus says that the world will hate you, he doesn't mean everybody will be against you. But, but in the New Testament, we see this distinction made between the world and the kingdom of God. And these two things uh, don't mix. They're like oil and water. There's the world, those who do not know Christ and do not know God, and then there's the kingdom made up of the citizens that Jesus has redeemed and is redeeming. You know him and know God. And if you are abiding in Christ, the world will hate you. Now, not always with the same intensity and not always consistently, but at some juncture, you know, this happens to me not infrequently with friends of mine who are unchristian friends, non-Christian friends. And they're nice people, and I have a lot in common with them, but every once in a while, something will come up that makes me realize, oh, they're loyal to a different kingdom than I'm loyal to. Uh, you will have left-leaning, worldly friends who will hate you because of your commitment to Christ. And you will have right-leaning, worldly friends who will hate you because of your commitment to Christ. You shouldn't be surprised by that, and you shouldn't be knocked off your game. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were so polar opposite in their partisan commitments and in their religious views that they hated one another. But they were allied together in their joint hatred for Jesus. And that's what Jesus said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. No, no matter how great the difference is between the ideologies of the world, they're more similar to one another 
than the ideology of the world to the kingdom of God. The Marxist, Paul Sweezy, and the capitalist, Ayn Rand, hated one another. But they were both allied in their hatred of C.S. Lewis because of the implications of his Christian faith. And here is perhaps the most difficult part of being a Christian. Besides loving one another, you must, Jesus told us, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You know, to uh, refer to C.S. Lewis again in his book Mere Christianity, which is a, a book that was written from a series of radio talks that he did uh, during and toward the end of the Second World War. And, and he took those and he edited them and he made them into that book Mere Christianity. And Lewis speaks about uh, Christian virtues, uh, Christian morality, and, uh, and what is the most unpopular of Christian virtues? You know, I think there's a kind of a sense sometimes where we look back to the end of the 1940s and we think of it as the good old days. It was a much more upstanding time than it is now. Um, if you really look into that period of history, there was a great deal of immorality. It was a different kind of immorality, but a great deal of immorality. And, and Lewis talks about that, and he says that, uh, that, 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 that it's not the virtue that we would expect. He says that he believes that the most unpopular of Christian virtues is the virtue of forgiving one's enemies. And this is what he writes. He says, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive, as we had during the war. And then to mention the subject at all is to be greeted with howls of anger. It is not that people think this too high and difficult a virtue. It is that they think it hateful and contemptible. That sort of talk makes me sick, they say. And half of you want to ask me, I wonder how you would feel about giving the Gestapo or forgiving the Gestapo if you were a Pole or a Jew. Well, so do I. I'm not trying to tell you in this book what I could do. I'm telling you what Christianity is. I did not invent it. And there, right in the middle of it, I find forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. There is not the slightest suggestion that we are offered forgiveness on any other terms. What are we to do? Let me encourage you, though, not to make the mistake that I made when I was a younger Christian of thinking that if you really endeavor to do that, you really endeavor to love your enemies, that doing that will lessen your enemy's hatred toward you. It won't. Let me read Jesus' words again. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And what was their response to that? They hated him. And unless you give up loyalty to Christ first, unless you give up loyalty to his kingdom as your highest loyalty... Unless you give up loving one another as Christ has loved you, unless you give up loving your neighbor and loving even your enemies, you can't really expect anything but hatred from the world. It won't be constant and it won't be the same intensity, but it will be there. But I want to tell you to be encouraged because when the world's hatred is directed at you from every side, 
when there's no camp that you can comfortably sit down in, when you have nowhere to lay your head, though foxes have dens and birds of the air have nests, you can be pretty sure that you're abiding in Christ and that the Spirit of Christ is abiding in you. In fact, to abide in Christ means being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, Jesus will go on to talk more about this in chapter 16. The Apostle Paul, throughout the book of 1 Corinthians, talks about what it means to uh, be in the Spirit and to walk in the Spirit and be filled with the Spirit. But I'm just going to read you one verse at the end of chapter 15 here, and you can look at those other passages this afternoon if you'd like. And that is this, that as Jesus is speaking to them, he tells them, when the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And it's important for us to be clear about what this means uh, in the coming of the Holy Spirit for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, we are not to make ourselves born of the Spirit. That remarkable work is something that happens to us, and it's not within our control. You know, Jesus told Nicodemus, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And, uh, and that's true, right? You can't control the wind. My, uh, my wife got some wind chimes for Christmas. She said, oh, can you put them up? Because it was, it was breezy out, it was windy. And so we hung up the wind chimes. And you know what happened as soon as I hung the wind chimes up? No wind. Because I can't control the wind. And, and that remarkable work of being born of the Spirit is not something that you're told to do. It's something that God does. We are not told to baptize ourselves by the Spirit or with the Spirit. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body. Note that Paul is speaking there in the indicative. He's telling us simply what has happened. We have passively been baptized into the body of Christ. Just as we are baptized with water into the church, we don't baptize ourselves right? We are baptized by the Spirit. What we are told to do in the New Testament, however, is to be filled with the Spirit. That is an imperative. It's a command. Now, we cannot be filled with the Spirit unless we've been born of the Spirit, unless we've been baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. But Christ came into the world to save persons made in the image of God, not to save blocks of wood. And that means that God calls us to a response. And so we're told, be filled with the Spirit. Positively, that's what we're told in Ephesians 5.18. Be filled with with the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, maybe it would help to know negatively what its opposite would be, which we're told in 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Do not quench the Spirit. That word quench means to stifle or suppress. That is, God has given to us His Spirit, that we are to walk by that Spirit. We're not to stifle or suppress that Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit of Christ, not suppressing the Spirit of Christ, will, effort, will evidence itself in loyalty to Christ and his kingdom first, love and loyalty for one another in the body of Christ before all earthly loyalties, and love even for our enemies as we bear the world's hatred. 
The spirit of Christmas can be an amazing thing. And the Christmas truce of 1914 is an amazing story. It's one of my favorites. Because on that night, the spirit of Christmas overcame the animosity of war. But remarkable as it was, it did not last. That's just the truth of it. The spirit of Christmas doesn't last. But the spirit of Christ, if he is really present in your life, does. And he changes you and makes you able to do things that might seem impossible. In fact, to the world might seem or would seem undesirable. And no small part of that change is imparting to you the ability to abide in Christ. An ability that looks, again, like loyalty to the kingdom of God above all earthly loyalties. Love for the people of God above all earthly loves. Looks like loving your enemies, praying for your persecutors desiring their good even while bearing up under their hatred. I hope you had a great Christmas. I really do. Um, Whether it happens January 1st, January 6th, or sometime in April, your tree is going to come down. Your decorations are going to come down. The lights are going to come down. And if you do that at some point in the winter, then we're just in for kind of the winter doldrums when everything looks sort of dead. The spirit of Christmas will not last. But if you are really in Christ, the spirit of Christ will. And you can only have the spirit of Christ if you come to Christ by faith and surrender your life to him. The spirit of Christmas can be amazing, but the spirit of Christ is abiding, and those who really know him abide in him. Father, we thank you that you have given to us your son, that your Son has given to us himself and has brought us to the Father, that he's given for us his life, and that in his ascension into heaven, he's given to us the Holy Spirit, by whom we may abide in you. Only, Father, help us to do what you've commanded to us, to be filled with that Spirit, not to quench the Spirit, and for the evidence of those things to be manifest in our life. Because, Father, while the Spirit of this season can be amazing, the Spirit of Christ is abiding forever. Amen. As we conclude our uh, worship here Uh, If you're able to, please rise and we'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of O Little Town of Bethlehem. Oh, uh-huh.
We're glad that you joined us to worship God today. Uh, as I mentioned before the service started, there won't be Sunday school tonight, but stay tuned. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be starting that up again. May God bless you into this coming year. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace today and always. Amen.